Welcome back to the next episode of Horizon Zero Dawn and the Shadow Karja Lands. Today is an exploration episode where we seek everything these lands have for us besides the main quest. First things first, I want that tall neck. We're going after that tall neck immediately and nothing will stop me from getting it. Uh, guys? Okay, now I'm really curious. Is everyone going to try and kill me for coming in here? I mean, what is about to happen when I come down to the city in the Shadow Karja Lands? I simply must know. Alright. Hey. Just don't touch anything. Blazon Ark. Get nothing from me. Off with you. Interesting. All right, let's take a look around, see what we find. For a little more food, I do whatever work these outlanders are doing and more. Excuse me, folks. I'm just looking around. Just checking for anything cool. Just uh, robbing you of all you have. I don't even need this stuff. But I'm taking it anyway because I can and because you cannot stop me. Outlanders are idiots, but perhaps they're useful idiots. Trader discovered. Hey. Uh, this guy's like not gonna complain about my existence. Boring. Alright, let's lose some resources that I do not need. Right, I just need to get rid of some uh, Ridgewood. You ever wonder why this guy has Nora stuff? I don't even need these sample boxes anymore. They do not matter. I am going to scrap some Ridgewood, though. I don't need this much. Just leave some Ridgewood lying around. Here, here's my payment for you. Stuff that literally anyone can collect. Is that all for Blazon Arc? It's a port. Clearly. Oh, just a campfire. Not sure I like the idea of hiring mercenaries, but it's better than living amongst his traitors. Hang on a second. Is that a data point? Hell yeah, it is. The Forbidden West. Oh, yeah, it's another one of the giant glyphs. Okay, here we go. Expeditions into the Forbidden West. Reader, if you would know of the Forbidden West, there are none more qualified to be your teller than I, the considerate Udain, healer of Blazon Ark. Why? For I yet live, unlike the outlanders who gasped or shrieked the tales that follow. Foolhardy Blazons and madcaps all, they were brought to me near death, poisoned, mortally wounded, or driven witless by what they had experienced in the lands beyond the daunt. With such wounds, it was all I could do to ease their pain and try to make notes from their ranting. As the sun shines upon me, I cannot vouch for the full truth of these tales. I only hope they will satisfy your curiosity and turn you from the path that led these impudent explorers and daredevil trekkers to their deaths. Though each account differs, it is certain that the western lands are most unlike our own. Some cross deserts of palest white, others deserts the color of fire, or even limitless sweeps of blue sand that seem to reflect the sky above, broken only by the remains of ancient machines. Others spoke of vast prairies of tall grass, each blade sharp enough to draw blood, dotted with shivering black flowers, or incalculable plains of dried mud, cracked like a great mosaic. At night, unknown animals watch with glowing eyes, and strange birds, all the colors of kites and fireworks, chitter and call out in men's voices. Most extraordinary of all are those reports of a lake 100 times the size of the Daybrink, so wide that the far shores cannot be made out, and so deep that an entire city of the ancients stands drowned within. The water is sour to the taste and sickening, and it is said to rise up and push back against those who attempt to cross. Ocean. 
It would seem that dead cities without number have been consumed by the shifting dunes in the west, their skeletal towers murdered in seas of sand. The wind is heard to sing a low, mournful song through these ruins, or through the skeletons of vast metal birds now fallen, or over great metal bowls now filled with depths of black water, where fish dart like shooting stars. That song of ruin, rising from a hum to a howl, still haunted these men and women as they thrashed and sweated in unquiet sleep. But though the western lands are harsh, and even their beauty hides dangers, it is not the land alone that swallows up all who venture within, that inflicts the brands and wounds suffered by those few fortunate enough to return. Oh yes, all have spoken of new machines in the west, machines more strange and terrible than any found in the Sundom. With their fingernails, dying witnesses have scratched out impossible shapes, or, if they still possessed several limbs and vocal organs, mimicked jerking movements and imitated awful sounds, all belonging in the throes of madness. And what manner of men can live where the sun goes at night? These tales were the most chilling. One spoke of drinkers of machine blood, their lips and tongues stained, their teeth replaced with metal. Another described youths as pale as ash, all wearing the same faces, who hunt silently and tirelessly in the night. Still another told of a tribe, seen only from afar, whose folk busied themselves digging deep pits in the sand, only to fill them in again for unknowable reasons, while another tribe was only glimpsed on the waters of the Great Lake, riding their thin dark boats. O oh son, a half of me regrets scribing these stories, for they inspire questions that can only be answered by yet more doomed expeditions. And yet, I must tell the tales, for what else remains of these poor and wretched men and women? If they sought riches, they found none to bring back, nothing save a handful of black silk, or a curiously stamped piece of metal, a chunk of desert glass with shifting hue, or an odd smooth shell. I have kept all these things to remind me of those who went in search of the forbidden and paid for it dearly. Reader, if you think yourself an adventurer, heed the warning in this old man's collection of strange small things and go not into the Forbidden West. Ooh, I'd play a game of Horizon set in the Forbidden West. Until this game concludes, I cannot make a fair judgement on whether or not I believe this game should have a sequel. But I've seen other people saying they want it to have a sequel, so maybe it's possible. That's my Ridgewood. Ceasefire or no, my family is starving. Avad will have to answer for that eventually. Your family wouldn't be starving if you hadn't run off out here. Alright. Nice little port town. Oh, that big old noise I hear is the tall neck. Of course it is. Alright, let's go chill with the tall neck. We've checked out this town. We found one data point. Is that another one up here? No. I thought I saw something up here. I saw nothing. Alright. Hopefully I haven't missed any more data points. Otherwise, you know, that's our uh, post-game collection stuff. I've already committed that until I beat the main quest, I will not bother collecting data points scattered around that I don't just naturally find. That way the final episode of the final episodes can just be data point collection and maybe the collection of trophies to get my platinum. Because I do very, very much want that platinum. Mm -hmm. Did I go the wrong way? Yes, like a fool, there is further up to go. Get those mad ops! Wish I could go even faster. I really liked when I was doing that quest before, and I saw the tall neck from so far away. That was a good effect. I really like tall necks. I'm picking up another signal. Sup, folks? Nothing? Okay. Do I want some striders? Mm, no. I want a tall neck. Long leg one, long leg two. 
Atomic Signal. Tolnek Rust Wash. Cool. There's a fight going. I guess I should save the boys. Nope, they're very dead. Okay, never mind. Oh, that watcher though. Okay, I need to get up to the Tolnek's head. I think I can leap onto the Tolnek. Oh no! That's an explosion. Oh no. Okay, I guess I have to do some machining first. Wait, no. Everyone chilled out. Alright, we're good. Oh, these are- this is a broken plane, isn't it? Maybe. Alright, y'all don't see me down there. Fire Bella back, Fire Bella back, Watcher. Either of you two see me? Nah, they my invisibility works too well. Oh, you're investigating the corpse. Wow! Okay, now I understand why this outfit is the good outfit. Good lord! What's that? Just a watch up. Alright, our tall neck friend will be here shortly. And after that, we are done with... Uh this area, and we can start hunting down everything the tall neck will mark for us. Hey, Budo! Oh! I haven't been there, have I? I have not! Alright! Now to climb up to its head. There are some people down here dying against machines, but I really don't care. The final toll neck. Aloy! Damn! Damn, girl, you got those moves. You are now mine. And the world is mine. Yeah, bring me back around to that place because I want to check that out. While we're waiting, give me a look at this map. Oh my god. Well, the map is cleared. The entire map of Horizon Zero Dawn. Okay. Campfire. Building. Campfire. Vantage. Campfire. Campfire. Uh, yep, I know this place. This is where I came in from and drew the line. 
Sunfall. So what do we got? One campfire, two campfire, three campfire, four... Not that much, honestly. There isn't a lot going on out here. Yeah, I think we can complete all the Shadow Karja lands in one episode. Let's see if this burst knocks out some machines. Yeah, that unleashes a wave of electric damage on everything around. Who this? Just dead watcher. Alright, let's get to it. First things first, we're getting this. So let's roll. Just gotta make sure I don't get stepped on by that tall neck. Tall necks are so majestic. They're my favorite machine. There are so many machines out here. This place is rancid with machines. It is unreasonable how many there are. Okay, so is this place stocked with normal people or fighty guys? What's that spinning up there? Alright, normal people fight it. normal people. Shifts flight. Hmm, looks like there's nothing to this place. It is actually just complete garbage. Can I climb up the outside at all? Nope. Yo, but what's your spinny thing up there? I guess I'm destined never to know. That's disappointing. Alright, let's go get this Vantage. It's gonna require us to head along the coast here. There will be Glint Hawks. Let's not get involved with those if I can do my best. If I can do my best, we will not get involved with those Glint Hawks. Beautiful sights, though. I imagine people who live in Colorado must just love this game. They're like, yeah, I know there, I know there. Well, I don't know how well this is... It's been like a thousand years. I don't know how much this place is modeled on... Colorado. As it currently is. Okay, no Glint Hawk Arena. Luckily, with Silent Sprint, I can just do whatever I want. The Glint Hawks will still pay attention to me if they get a good look at me. Like that one. Uh. Where? Must be a Glint Hawk. Hey. Two burn sessions and a glint hawk goes down. Speaking of going down, we need to find our way down here. Can I do that? No. Goodness, no. That's a death fall. How am I getting down here then? Hmm. That's how. Oh, not a bunch of long legs. Oh, that's gonna be a steep one. I hope this isn't a fall to my doom. Might regret this. 
No, we're good. Aloy has the balance of queens. Alright, now how do I get back up here? Well, I'm down here now. Hey, it's that Glinhawk I killed. Super murdered that Glinhawk. Oh, campfire located. And a snap more. Cool, excellent, wonderful. Hey, how do I get back up, though? I think I have to go around or something. I don't know, maybe I should have dropped down from above. I like how these guys just create and then deposit chill water. Where the hell am I? I'm under some logs. Alright. Hold square to dive. And we're up again. Cool. Good job, me. Snap moors avoided. Now, we still need to find our way back up if such a thing is possible. That was a good start. There's some climbing points on the other side of this. Gotcha. The last vantage in the game. You guys know what that means. It's going to be some reading time. Here we go. Oh. Day 11. I came out here to die. But instead of overdosing at Wyatt's cottage, I went out walking along the water. I was standing right here when the idea hit me. And the moment it did, I knew I had to do it. Alright, here we go. That's all the vantages. We are going to be reading these eight now. Oh boy, I hope you guys are ready for this. Pocket Shitstorm Tour, Day 9. Setting up my tent right here when Wyatt's call came through. I came as fast as I could, but you'd already slipped into a coma. We never got a chance to say goodbye. Hi, Ma. My plan was to go camping here after the AMOS 15 launch. I'd been working O to OT overtime for the past nine months, so I was pretty frazzled. Figured I should take a weekend to relax before Crunch started up again. I was settling up, setting up in my tent when Wyatt's call came through. He said it was an emergency. I called a lift spin vert and made it to Denver General in less than 27 minutes. I was too late. You'd already slipped into a coma. I didn't understand how that could be, but when I told Wyatt to explain, he just kept choking up, waving me towards the care station. So it was a hollow doc that broke the news. How you'd been diagnosed a year earlier. The adverse reactions to gene therapy and polymer vascular replacements. The six months of mobile dialysis. I couldn't believe you'd kept it all secret from me. Even at the height of crunch, I called you once or twice a week. So you just sat there, listening to me enthuse about my latest project or complain about workplace politics? And all the while you were dying? It didn't make sense. I marched back to Wyatt, cornered him, and demanded that he explain. He said you hadn't wanted to distract me, that I was doing important work and needed to focus. You know, as though the latest AMOS launch in the Palladium and Rhodium it'd bring back to Earth mattered more than the Mark was already here. Wyatt kept saying how proud you were of me. He even parroted that onwards and upwards phrase of yours. He said I should get back to work, and that's what you would have wanted. That he'd stay at the hospital and keep me informed. I didn't go back to work. I called in. It took arguing my way past two supervisors, a labyrinthian automated HR menu, a human resources AI and an anal defensive benefits executive to activate my personal leave, but I did it. And then I sat at your bedside for the next seven days. I kept thinking of the hospital after my OD at the amphitheater, kept thinking that if you came out of the coma, I wanted my face to be the first thing you saw. 
on the eighth day they pronounced you dead. After the funeral, I went back to work, but I wasn't really there. I kept telling myself to focus, that it was okay to be there. It was what you would have wanted after all, onwards and upwards. But my work fell behind. When my supervisor called me in for an emergency review, I told myself to play it cool, accept the criticism, and promise to do better. It didn't go like that. I snapped and shouted at him, and then broke down, sobbing uncontrollably. Two minutes and three sec drones later, and I was standing outside the Pharaoh building, blinking in the sunshine, straightening my bunched up clothes. An alert on my focus indicated that I should go home for the day, then report for a disciplinary, re disciplinary review on Monday. But I didn't go home. Another idea had risen up in my mind, already fully formed. I guess I'd already been thinking of doing it for a while. I took a lift spin to Pioneer Park. Ten minutes of asking around and a truth test to show I wasn't a cop was all it took to make a connection. I went home with the drugs, started using, and didn't stop. Duster, snake, skydive, overcast. No razor wing, at least. I didn't take calls, didn't show up for dis the disciplinary review on Monday morning. A friend stopped by and hammered the door until I answered it. When he saw what was happening, he staged a one-man intervention. I agreed to go into treatment, but I didn't harbor any illusions. Use of personal leave was bad, but use of psych SA leave? Career suicide. Sure, they couldn't legally fire me for it, but I'd been around FAS long enough to know they'd find a way. My career was over. I thought I was at rock bottom, but I was wrong, of course. I still had a long way to fall. Poker Shitstorm Tour Day 7. I was three months out of rehab when we went camping out here. Wyatt went to sleep early, so it was just the two of us when we stayed up and watched the Perseids. After, after, as we talked about the stars and space tech, I suddenly knew what I wanted to do with my life. Hi Ma. It was August. Summer school had wrapped, and I'd aced my courses, so I was heading back to 10th grade with a good head of steam. As a reward for my studies and my sobriety... Sobriety? You and Wyatt gave me a Fullerton Labs Astro Prodigy and took me camping to watch the Perseids at the peak. I was amped. Wyatt spent all afternoon struggling with a self-constructing shelter he'd bought for the trip, until finally he gave up and built the damn thing manually. Well, the sleeping pods, anyway. While we made a fire and cooked dinner, it must have taken a lot out of him, because Wyatt was nodding off at dinner and went to bed soon after. As night fell, we sat and watched the meteors streak across the sky like fingernail scratches, marveling at their abundance, laughing our delight. After an hour or so, you asked me to teach you the constellations, so I launched the Astro Prodigy and played Professor, spouting off about each star group as the drone magnified them. Later, I had it zoom in on the Odyssey, which was still being constructed in orbit back then. It was another year or two before they abandoned it. We could actually see the robots building it, zipping across the hole like little fireflies. So I jabbered about that, which got me started on yammering about the robots that Pharaoh and other corporations, even Metallurgic, had begun sending up to mine Helium-3 from Luna and metals from the asteroid belt. The more I spoke about space tech, the more excited I became. But I was getting cold too. Deserts at night are like that. So I sat back down next to you and we huddled under the camp blanket. For a little while we were quiet. I wanted to say what I was thinking, but it felt ridiculous. But then Wyatt snored explosively from inside the shelter, and we giggled, and our laughter seemed to make an opening for me to just go ahead and say it. That I, your delinquent son who'd almost flunked out of high school, who nearly died of an OD at a bash core concert, wanted to be an aerospace engineer and make the sorts of machines we'd been talking about. Robots to gather resources in the solar system. Maybe even ones that could travel to other stars and colonize new worlds. You looked at me and smiled. Then that is what you will do. And then you looked up at the night sky and said, very plainly, as though it was a simple fact, you will write the story of our family across the stars. School started the next week, and I never looked back. Day 12. As we watched the booster arc up into the night sky, riding a pillar of flame, you took my hand, squeezed it, and said, you have written the story of our family across the skies, across the stars. Hi, Ma. Last stop. After this... I'll have said everything I need to. It was just a routine launch, but for us it might as well have been Apollo 11. It was my first payload, a seeker extractor with an upgraded propulsion system I'd designed. The vehicle was destined for M89282, an asteroid rich in ruthenium and tungsten. A metallurgic claim, as it happened. 
a family event through and through. So there we stood in the open air as night fell and the stars came up. And of course I was thinking of that night years before when we watched the Perseids together and talked and dreamed of this very moment. You were thinking of it too, because when the booster launched, as it rose into the sky in its jet of flame, you took my hand and said, you have ridden the story of our family across the stars. Even then I knew it wasn't true. The vehicle was headed for a rock, not a star. It was a routine launch, not some voyage of discovery. But my heart was too full to quibble. I just smiled and squeezed your hand back. It was the finest moment of my life. You and me, Ma, onwards and upwards. The start of great things. But after you died and I broke down, the meaning of that night changed. Everything that had seemed wonderful seemed to turn rotten and false. It seemed false because it was false. I'd never ridden anything across the stars. Sure, I'd hoped to work on a project like that, a deep space probe or a colony ship, but it never happened. Now that my career was over, it never would. And then, when I found out about the plague, the memory haunted me even worse. Because it wasn't just me who failed to write a story across the stars, you see. It was all of us, our entire species, all our innovation, all our tech, all our striving, and it came to zero. I've been looking up at the stars a lot, Ma, and the only story I see written across them is that we are small and insignificant and will soon disappear with hardly a trace left behind. It's a hard story and I don't much like it, so I guess maybe what I've been trying to do these past 12 days is tell a different story. Not a big story, written across the stars, but a tiny one, written across the humble earth of the only world we ever got to know. I have no reason to think that anyone or anything will survive to ever read it. But whether that happens or not, the truth of the story remains. That once upon a time, on a planet called Earth, there lived a boy named Bashar who loved his mother very, very much. Goodbye, Ma. I love you. Bashar Mahdi, son of Armal and Bayas Mahdi, stepson of Wyatt Mahante, 24th of November, 2064. The order of this is wrong. That should have been the very last thing I read. That's really frustrating. Day 11. I came out here to die, but instead of overdosing at Wyatt's cottage, I went out walking along the water. I was standing right here when the idea hit me, and the moment it did, I knew I had to do it. Hi, Ma. I came here with a duffel full of drugs after I found out about the plague. I had a plan, a simple one. I figured I'd spend a few days getting high, then OD on Overcast. I guess I was still furious at Wyatt for aiding and abetting your silence. If everything had gone according to plan, my corpse would have lay rotting in the cottage for who knows how long. He would have needed to lease catastrophic cleaning bots just to scrape me off the floor. A skeletal middle finger from beyond the grave. But things didn't go to plan. For some reason, I went out walking before I got high. I trudged along the shore, thinking of all the times we walked and talked here, how I'd changed over the years, how you'd stayed the same. Whether I was a high, school jabber high schooler jabbering about AP classes, or a university student gossiping about my professors, or a FAS engineer pontificating about payload yields, you were always there, always listening, always interested, and always encouraging me, of course, spurring me onwards, onwards and upwards. But now here I was, an abject failure, standing alone on this beach. As all around me, children chased playbots across the sand, sunbathers basked, families splashed in the water or zipped past on old tummy boats, utterly oblivious to the mechanical terrors that would soon consume them. Brief moments in the sun, doomed to end in horror and amount to nothing. All your love and devotion, all the sacrifices you made to support my success, what did that come to? Failure. And at such cost, we never even got a chance to say goodbye. But even if I hadn't failed, if I'd gone on succeeding, would that have been any better? The whole time I was clawing my way up the ladder at FAS, the company's military division was creating the tech that would end the world. I served the same master. Success was a ladder to nowhere. It just took falling off and landing on the Vantage project to see it. I don't know why but the irony of that had never hit me until I was standing on this beach. 
that it was only because I'd failed to be assigned to Vantage, an abandoned time capsule project, that I'd found out the world was ending. Irony? More like a cosmic joke. Why, then, did the realization hit me like an inspiration? I had access to the tech. I knew I could do it. Sure, in the end, it would probably all just come to nothing, like everything else. But for 50,000 years or more, whatever data I left behind would still be there. It wouldn't be much, but it wouldn't be nothing either. I went back to the cottage, stashed the drugs, called a lift spin in town. If I was going to make an end of the world tour, I figured I might as well do it in style. So I leased a Sabara and rode that to FAS. I let myself into the lab, signed out 12 Vantage Spikes for testing, put them in the trunk of the Sabara, and the rest is history. It was less than two weeks ago. Feels like forever. When I started the tour, I figured I'd come back here and pick up where I left off. Get high, then dead. But the first thing I did when I got back was incinerate the drugs. All 2.5 months of salary worth. So that bridge to oblivion has literally been burned. I don't know how I'm gonna die, but it can't be like that. I know how you felt about me and drugs. However it happens, I can at least promise you this. I will die clean. I still have one less last spike to sink. One final step on the Grand Mystery Tour. I'll see you there. Pock Shitstorm Tour, Day 1. We're better to start than at the end. I really should have read these in the day order. I really should have. I'm mad that I didn't realize to do that. We're better to start than at the end. Or where the end started, anyway. Ground Zero, where it all came crashing down. My career first, then everything else. I mean everything. Hi, Ma. Remember how ecstatic we were when I landed a job here? Aerospace control engineer at Faro Automated Solutions. Straight out of Stanford U. Saturday, Stanford U. Saturday I was tossing a mortarboard. Monday I'm an employee of the biggest corporation on Earth. Starting wage, six times basic. It was a dream come true. Yours as much as mine. When I found out I'd landed the gig, I waited until graduation day to tell you in person. You were so proud. You hugged me five minutes straight, laughing and crying at the same time, saying over and over, onwards and upwards, the start of great things. And I thought so too. It seemed as though nothing bad would ever happen to me, to us, ever again. But bad did happen, of course. More bad than I ever knew was possible. And while I can't blame FAS for making you sick, Metallurgic gets the credit for that, I sure as hell can blame Half Arrow for the rest. But let's talk about the end of the world later. It plays a part in the story, of course. If I hadn't found out what was coming, I wouldn't be doing this, leaving these time capsules behind. But the apocalypse isn't the story I want to tell. This is going to be about our family, about us. It's time to get going. I've spent enough of my life in the shadow of this place. I've got 11 more vantage spikes in the trunk of the Sabara I rented, and some pretty good ideas for where to sink them. So let's get the hell away from this place and start sinking. Really wish I'd known how to read this in order. Day 10. So here's where I learned how the world would end. My second apocalypse in a year. Looks like there's a lot of construction going on now. Why would that be? Hi, Ma. I was surprised when FAS sent me out here. Not just because the meeting was, to be, was, going, was going to be held in real space. I was surprised to discover that anyone at FAS still knew I existed. When I returned to work after treatment... HR informed me I'd been reassigned to the Vantage Project. It was exactly the professional death sentence I was expecting. The career equivalent of getting sent into a red zone without an environment suit. Everyone knew Vantage was one of those doomed projects FAS kept around solely for the purpose of assigning dead-enders to them. Especially head cases like me, who couldn't be summarily fired for fear of parody litigation. Month by month, management would pile losers on a lost cause, then cancel the project and lay everyone off. A ship of fools sunk with a single torpedo. Ain't wrongful dismissal if it's downsizing. I had nothing better to do, so I spent my time studying the tech. Chip design wasn't my forte, but I knew enough to admire what the engineers had accomplished with the Eternity chip. Stored data was guaranteed to last 50,000 years or more without degradation. As for Vantage itself, the project was little more than a failed marketing plan. The idea was to promote the tech by burying under unlocked Eternity chips at scenic locales around the world. Public domain time capsules where enthusiasts could cache date pick locked data. The project got as far as developing the spikes, portable drill applicators, to sync the chips, then stalled when grass, ga, grass heckling 
Capsulets came on the market and stole Eternity's Thunder. Anyway, I'd been at Vantage three weeks when FAS unexpectedly sent me out here for a real space meeting. Me, a dead-ender working a doomed project, dispatched to a high-security FAS R&D site inside King's Peak. It didn't make sense. Security put me in a small conference room and told me to wait. It was downright claustrophobic. Dim lights, bad ventilation, more like an interrogation room for one of those 90s cop vids. But what really got my attention was the noises coming through the walls. The non-stop bang and clatter of construction bots, building something deep in the mountain. Something big. The door opened and some dupes wearing FAS badges fell in. I recognized one of them, Brad Andek, a military division replications engineer I met when I first joined the company. But I don't think he recognized me. He stayed the, at the back of the room the whole time, looking distraught. I was about to ask what the hell was going on when a woman wearing a hijab walked in. She didn't introduce herself, but she didn't have to. It was Samina Ebaji, former lead activist, archivist of the Odyssey, architect of the entire Homer project. Not a global celebrity by any means, but if you grew up following the Odyssey project like I did, you knew her on sight. Abadji sat down and started asking extremely precise questions about the upper range tolerances of Eternity chips. Then she asked me to speculate about the feasibility of various upgrade paths. The interview lasted maybe 10 minutes, whereupon she thanked me for my time and left. Everyone else filed out after her. Security came for me a few minutes later and escorted me to my vert. The whole way back to FAS, I kept trying to figure out what had ha just happened. What was Samani Abadji doing at a classified Pharaoh R&D site, asking me questions about Eternity Tech? It didn't add up. By the time I landed, I knew I wasn't going to give up until I'd puzzled it out. The worst that could happen was I'd get fired, and that was going to happen anyway. It took a couple days and some geo work, but I got a fix on Brad Andak soon enough. He was going to a different bar every night, drinking to the point of blacking out. I shattered him until I managed to proxy his focus and dupe his net protocols. I didn't find anything strange in his financial records or media patterns. I was starting to think I'd wasted my time. Then I accessed his Dreambox account, found the journal he'd been keeping the past few weeks. It was all there. How the world would end. My first thought was, well, at least my ma didn't live to see this. My second thought was that nothing mattered anymore, which made it pretty obvious that I should kill myself. Pocket Shitstorm Tour Day 5. The Grey Swarms opened for Turtle Smash the night I OD'd here. Or so the police report said anyway. I was 15 years old. When I woke in the hospital two days later, your face was the first thing I saw. Hi Ma. I don't remember anything about the concert, the bands, the music, the crowd. I was too throttled on Skydive and Snake that night to distinguish the thunder of Bashkor from the roar of blood in my head. And then I ran across a pusher who was selling Razor Wing for 8 bucks a tab. That's right, Razor Wing. A certain designer stimulant named after a certain late 30s fighter craft that our family had a certain unpleasant association with. So I declined the offer, headed the, heated the ominous portent and got the hell out of, the, out of there, right? Or maybe what I did was buy four tabs and take them all at once. Yeah, did that. According to the police report, I went berserk and attacked the pusher, then set fire to his stash, then went after the security drones that showed up. I didn't get far. The drones put 50,000 volts through me, which wouldn't have been such a big deal if my heart hadn't already been hammering along at triple time. The shock flat out killed me. The medbots came fast as they could, but the first glitched out and the second got hung up in the crowd, so I was dead for almost two minutes. And even after they revived me, my condition was touch and go on account of all the substances sloshing through my veins. When I came out of the coma, your face was the first thing I saw. <laughs> You'd been crying. Your makeup was smudged, dark lines down your cheeks. When our eyes met, I expected you to start yelling, and weak as I was, I was ready to yell back. Not even a coma could break my defiance. But you didn't yell. You quietly asked Wyatt to wait in the hall, then pushed your chair right up to the edge of my bed and took my hand. I wanted to jerk my hand back, but I couldn't. It wasn't the strength of your grip that stopped me, but the warmth of your hand, the gentleness with which you took mine. When you spoke, your voice was quiet, just above a whisper. When I lost your barber seven years ago, you were my only reason to go on living. Your gaze lifted to the medical equipment surrounding us, the tubes and blinking lights. You shook your head. Why do you live like no one loves you? Don't you realize that if you die, all my hopes and dreams, and all the hopes and dreams of your father, 
Was I with you? You reached and touched my fair and like a hair, and like a thunder crack, I broke. Or maybe I was just snapping back together. I lay there sobbing for what felt like years. The whole time, you never took your hand away, and I didn't either. The next day I agreed to go into treatment. I wish I could say I never picked up again, but as we both know, that's not exactly how things turned out. Pocket Shitstorm Tour Day 6. I was fresh out of rehab when we saw the metallurgist play their hearts warfarers. Wayfarers. The eminent jersey looked pretty funny over your three. Hi Ma. So this would have been late May or early June. I was only a week or two out of rehab, still feeling pretty raw, pretty jangly about sober life. You'd already gone toe to toe with Mr. Gerson, that jerk principal who tried to block my readmission. I was looking at eight weeks of summer school to make up for all the courses I'd flunked, but I didn't mind. Without drugs, I didn't really know what to do with myself yet, so I welcomed the structure. The metallurgists were playing the Wayfarers, and as usual, Wyatt had box tickets. But this was the first time I'd agreed to go. Hell, it was probably the first time I'd ever agreed to do anything as a family. In retrospect, I'm surprised Wyatt was willing to bring his hellion stepson to a public event so soon. I'd seen Team Slug It Out on Hollow before, of course, but seeing it in the real was a whole other thing. The size of the machines, their speed, the way they bashed each other to pieces. It was intense! All at once, my fascination with tech, which had kind of faded as I'd sunk into the drugs, came roaring back. When Homi Raman, the team's chief engineer, stopped by the box at halftime, I was all over him, blasting him with questions like a one-boy press conference. Looking back, it wouldn't surprise me if you took me to that game, hoping to get me excited about tech before I headed into summer school. Or was it that you wanted me to catch a glimpse of corporate privilege? It was always your dream that I'd end up in engineering or business. Well, there was plenty of engineering on display when Connor 12 scored with an 18 meter rocket jump. And plenty of VPs and even sea levels in the box with us when we cheered the goal. Yeah, it was a setup. You knew what you were doing. Always did. That's the full set of vantages. I regret the order I read it in. The order presented was not good. I should have read it in the day's order. One. Two. Three. Four. Five. Six. Seven. Eight. Nine. Ten. Eleven. Twelve. I wish I'd known to read it in order, I hadn't, and so it was a fractured order. Sorry that I can't go back and do that again, but that's it for Vantages. Next episode, we will clear out the remaining campfires, this corrupted zone, this metal flower, this Banook figure, cash those all in at Meridian, and then all that's left in the game is the plot. All that's left is the plot. Alright, we're wrapping up here. Thank you all for watching. Have a wonderful day, and I will see you next time. Bye-bye.